Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the latest in our lockdown uh, webinar series. Um, if you don't know me by now, I'm Natalie from British Orienteering, and we've got Scott Bailey here from Bristol Orienteering Club, who is going to take us through um, the Usinglo app that they've been using as an alternative to MapRun. Um, and I'll leave it up to him to literally go through everything and um, demonstrate it, hopefully give you some practical examples of what they've done as a club. Um, and if there's any questions you want to ask, the same as all the other webinars, um, there is a questions button on the dashboard on the right hand side. And all you need to do is simply type away any question you like um, during Scott's um, session. And if it's related to something he's delivering at the time, I'll come in and ask that question for you. Otherwise, we'll ask them all at the end. But do fire away with any questions or queries you have. Hope you enjoy the session. And I'll hand over to you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. So, um, Scott Bailey, um, I'm from Bristol Orienteering Club. Um, I guess I've been orienteering for about 10 years now, but largely because of my son uh, got us into it as a family, um, who's Jim Bailey. Um, uh, interestingly, I've only been mapping since uh, November last year. So, um, this uh, has been a bit of a, a steep learning curve for me. But lockdown has helped me uh, experience all sorts of new stuff, and I'll go through a little bit of that um, as we go through. So uh, I've got a couple of slides uh, that I'll take people through. Um, what I'm going to cover off is why why did we choose to use using uh, Singlo for Bok? Um, I'm going to cover off how um, you can use the app as an orienteer. Um, what it's like to use it as a course planner and a couple of considerations for mapping uh, and planning. Um, one of the things I will say is that the um, webinars that Pat did uh, for Map Run, a whole bunch of the content that's in those is absolutely applicable for both, both apps. Um, and one of the things that uh, we are certainly doing as a club is still in experiment mode, um, looking at both uh, Usinglo and uh, map run at the same time and I'll come back on to where they are good uses for, for different uh, purposes. So why did um, why did Bok uh, try to uh, use your single and why are we using it uh, to experiment? Um, so there was a couple of things. First of all, we already had a pretty extensive catalogue of high quality uh, OCAD urban maps and uh, just as lockdown was happening, we were having a go at using Map Run. Uh, we had one trial, uh, trial run up and up and running on online, but what we didn't have was uh, a, you know a whole load of them. Um, and we realised quite quickly if we were going to do anything beyond um, lockdown in terms of uh, giving access to maps and orienteering for our members. Um, it was going to require quite a lot of uh, a steep learning curve for a number of people. Um, uh, and I certainly didn't want to become the bottleneck for putting maps online. Um, so we wanted to progress quickly. We didn't really, like I said, have any that were um, put, uh, any public virtual orienteering courses uh, available for our members. Um, and we really wanted to use the existing tools that we had. So we use OCAD um, almost extensively as a club for mapping. Um, and we use Condis and some of us use Purple Pen for course planning. So what we looked for was how could we quickly use those tools to get some of our uh, courses online. And uh, we also wanted to have multiple people being able to contribute. Um, particularly some of our juniors are quite keen on using Purple Pen for course planning. Um, and we were keen on getting them to have a go at using it. Um, one of the other things that we looked at um, was could we get something out there that was simple uh, for our members to use? Um, I, I, as many clubs have, have, I'm sure, got we've got a whole mix of juniors through to um, the, the more uh, mature runner, um, some of which are not that um, tech savvy. And um, we wanted to get an app that we could use quickly with anybody that had, you know, when a number of our members have never used smartphones before, let alone uh, put an app on them. And I'll come back to some good stories about that as well. Um, and 
when we did look at uh, using uh, using LIGO, we also realised that the Scandinavians had not only used it for urban events, but they'd used it in the forest as well. So uh, that encouraged us even further to, to have a go. Um, as I said, we are still open to experimenting uh, with other technologies and we can see a case of both using LIGO and uh, Matt Run. So one of the things um, I've been uh, looking at is um, we, our use case for using LIGO really was about uh, training runs, um, getting courses up quickly for members to go out and do some personal training. And then eventually, if we can get socially distance training up and run again using the technology as well. What we didn't have in mind was organized informal events because we already had a uh, long standing urban series that uh, runs through the summer months uh, using OCAD maps. Um, and therefore, we weren't looking for a, a sort of pseudo replacement for SI in any way, shape or form. We were just looking for something that we could use simply uh, for training runs. Um, interestingly, what we have found then is that the results service in Usingligo is only in the app and not on the website. And therefore, in its current form, is not really best suted for uh, informal uh, 60 minute score events where people turn up at similar time and, and run it on the same evening um, and you get some results at the back end of that. Whereas Map Run uh, is, um, and we can see a case for having, you know, informal events, maybe with our neighbours with Pat uh, in uh, North Gloucestershire, where we could put a couple of Map Run events on at the same time and use the same technology. So like I said, it's, it's, uh, it's there to uh, give us an alternative to Map Run, not as a complete replacement. Um, let me uh, go on to then, well, what's it like to use the app as an orienteer? Well, this was the bit that was, uh, for me, um, quite important really, was could we get something simple up and running quickly? So for an orienteer, effectively, you go to the uh, App Store, um, and that, whether that's uh, Google App Store or the Apple App Store, and you download the Usinglego app. Uh, luckily, with a strange name like Usinglego and uh, I guess people might be asking, why is it called Yusingo? It's uh, Norwegian and Yusin League means invisible. So it's invisible, i.e. orienteering without flags in the terrain. Uh, there is only one Yusingo app on the uh, App Store, so it's pretty easy to find. Once you've downloaded the app, you go to their website um, and you print out your map so you can get a fully uh, high quality printed map. And I'll show a little bit about that as well. You then go to where you want to run, you select the course, uh, the app itself is geolocated. So when you get close to the course that you're about to run, the top course will be uh, the one that displays within the app. You click start, you run it, you get your results. That's it. There's no, no more, uh, nothing more complicated than that. And I'll show the app in a minute as well. Um, so why again simple interface there's not really as many features as map run um, and i'll show a little bit now that's a that's a positive for people that are a bit more scared of technology uh um, but has some negatives i guess if you're uh, an organizer and that you don't really get many options around how you organize uh events like i said it's geo aware um, and we also thought about it as being a way of distributing high quality maps um, one of the things that uh, is really positive about using Lego is that it uploads PDF maps. So the quality of the map that people can get for printing out at home is, um, is just as good as you would get at uh, a printer's, which means that people that are a bit more scared of uh, using a smartphone but still want to use a map printer out and uh, go for a run, they can, and that's our way of uh, distributing our maps at the moment. One of the other things is that it only really, it does have an auto start feature like Map Run. However, uh, by default, it only starts when you click start, which I find really useful because it gives me time to get to a place where you're going to run. You click the start button, you get five second timer like you would on a, uh, a normal orienteering event, and then you go. Um, and the course finishes when you either finish the course, if it's a line event, or if you complete a score event, or you stop the app, and it supports both line and uh, score courses. Um, the website itself is always also linked into Google and the apps linked into Google as well. So what that means is that you get um, 
the ability to get directions to where the course is, uh, which is useful if you don't know the area at all. But also, um, I'll show you within the app, you get to see some Google Maps, etc., where you can overlay your uh, course run over a Google Map to see where you went. Um, and it also has a feature that you can categorize your uh, courses by your own categories, um, which means that we've categorized all of our runs as BOC events, and we're able to provide our members then with a single uh, link to all of the BOC um, uh, using Glow courses. So um, I'll, I'll now go into a couple of things and just show you what and why and how. Um, so let me just quickly go to the, um, the BOC website, first of all, just so you can see. Um, and bear with me a second. Right. So on the um, Bristol Orienteering website, we now have a virtual orienteering course uh, section. It's linked into all of our uh, beginners uh, materials as well. If we click on, on that, what that now has is uh, instructions on how you print your map, how you can use the app, how you can download it, some hints and tips on using the technology. As I said, we are learning as we go. We've only been using it for, uh, this is our fourth week now, um, and we've learned quite a lot about what works and what doesn't work with the technology. Um, and as we've gathered them, we've had feedback on our Facebook chat, um, uh, group and we've posted those on our website as well and then instructions on how you go and run on your Singlo. We've also got lists of the courses that we've got so we've got everything from um, school courses that are 45 minutes long from yellow and white courses all the way through to black courses on some of our forest events now available. Um, other clubs feel free to you know if I click on some of the instructions, it shows you how to um, download the app, the app, it shows you how to get hold of a map um, and print the map. Feel free to take these materials if you feel like using them uh, for your own clubs as well. Um, this link just here, that's the link that goes to uh, Easting Lego and categorizes all of the Bristol Orienteering Club um, runs. So I'll quickly then go into the Easting Lego website when a um, when a user uses um, goes to the Singular website, this is what they get. It's pretty simple, bog standard. There's a link to the app store for them to download the app, um, and they also then uh, log in. Um, and the, the login's up here. They can log in and create their own username, and password, or they can log in if they've got a Google account. I found that logging in with a Google account is quite handy um, and that's certainly what I've uh, personally done. Um, one of the things then you get to do is you get to click on all events and uh, it, like I said it's location aware so you can ask it to select your location and you can see immediately there's the uh, Bristol Orienteering Club uh, runs. But first of all I'll show you part of the reason why when we were looking at uh, whether or not to use this or not, um, the Scandinavians obviously are quite good at orienteering, uh, and you can see that they have extensively used using low, and that's, uh, I'll just click on some of the examples, let me click on uh, one of these here, um, that's one of their maps, you can see that's a pretty heavily forested area, um, I'm quite jealous of not being able to run in something like that at the moment, um, but they, they've they also used, I've seen on here, um, training runs where they've used uh, contour only maps, so they're definitely using it for training events, I've seen them use corridor uh, maps as well for training events, so that's why we were quite interested in using the technology, because we could quite quickly get training um, up and running um, when that's when we're able to do that and when the lockdown measures allow us to do that. Um, so if I quickly go into some of the Bristol events just to give you a sense of um, where we are. So we've got I think 12 or 13 locations now and each of those locations have got uh, between six or seven um, events on them. So if I click on 
and I can show you uh, here's a sprint um, map as a we're using it in an urban area for example uh, with a with a long sprint um, again relatively simple but people are, quite a lot of people have enjoyed that and then I'll show you another example quickly uh, in a forested area where again a very complicated um, TD5 uh, complex forest area where we we used it and again uh, members have found that the app itself in the terrain uh, registers quite quite well um, one of the things that we found as well is that um, when you do run past the control it plays uh, a tune that um, registers that you've hit the right control it plays a different tune if you go past the wrong control so um, we don't have the same sorts of restrictions where you you have to have controls far apart you can have them relatively close together because um, the runner in the terrain will know when they've hit the right control versus the wrong control because it plays a different sound um, I'll quickly now switch to, uh, and that's it pretty much as a as a user of um, of uh, using Glow, you just download your map like that, you print it out on your home printer. Um, if I quickly then switch to, um, oh, I quickly switch to the app itself. Uh, right so this is my this is the app on my mobile phone um, uh, what you see is I'm already logged in um, as a user you just effectively click on using this Lego events um, and because it's geolocated it orders them uh, by which ones are closest to me um, the, this is a list of events that obviously within 50k of me um, I can uh, click on an event for example so if I click on uh, warmly um, we can quickly go into the short sprint uh, event so you can see I had multiple courses uh, uploaded uh, you can tap on the map itself so you get to see the map within the app um, and you can zoom in and out of that you can see that that's that's high quality uh, map uh, what's useful as well is that you can also uh, print the map from your phone if you want to um, and uh, I quickly go back out it'll also say how far away you are from from the start of that map so you can see just here I'm uh, just under 2k away from this course uh, and it will tell me how accurate I'm obviously indoors at the moment it tells me how accurate my GPS is um, one of the things then to quickly show is if I click the cog up in the top corner you can change a bit like map uh, you can change the accuracy of the GPS whilst you're running um, and we as a club have been experimenting with this uh, the control radius obviously is how big the circle is uh, before the app will successfully register you hitting the control um, we've tried it five meters all the way up to 30 meters we seem to 15 meters seems to be uh, relatively accurate for both urban and forest as long as your GPS accuracy is able to be quite wide um, and I've got mine set to 100 meters at the moment because I know um, over the weekend I was running a forest event in our local virtual eucola uh, race that we did um, where I ran a black course through um, through a forested area and I know that I was going through heavy trees so I needed to have my GPS set in a way that would allow the app to deal with inaccuracy. Um, those settings seem to work pretty well in both uh, urban and um, uh, forest environments. Uh, I'll come back uh, on as we go through to course planning what does have a big impact on whether people can register controls or not which is largely to do with the geolocation of the maps itself um, 
if I go back to, I'll go back to the long one because I know I've personally run that. You can see my splits for my time are there. I can also click on the little uh, three lines at the top um, and I can see the results of other runners um, and uh, I can uh, also click on the map because I've run this course already um, and I've got a little Google uh, button now in the top right corner which allows me to click on that and I can see an overlay of controls on a Google map and also um, my my personal trace from when I ran that course, which is quite handy again from a training perspective of how far away was I from the control when I was lost, uh, for example. Um, that's pretty uh, much it from the app. Uh, one final thing, uh, you can go into my races and you get a full list of the courses that you run yourself. Um, and you also get it with the little uh, person icon on the top corner, you can add in your name and your club, which means that when you do do a race and your results are uploaded, they come up with your name on them uh, in, in the app. Like I said, those uh, results at the moment are only in the app, they're not on the website. Um, I have um, actually been in contact with the developer Trond from uh, Norway, um, and he is in the process of looking at whether or not um, results uh, should be available online. One of the things that's currently stopping that is that he, he is personally funding the uh, hosting of this. Um, it's hosted on Google infrastructure, which means that it's unlikely to go down or anything. Um, but he's very keen on keeping the app free. Um, and so he's in contact with the Norwegian um, uh, orienteering Federation and the Swedish Orienteering Federation and others about uh, getting funding for it. Um, so if anybody is interested in helping and funding, I know Trond would be very uh, happy to get some funding to keep the uh, app up and running. Um, but given the number of users, I suspect that won't be necessarily a, a big problem for him. Um, so that that's the, the app. Um, like I said, very simple to use. Um, you run, it beeps. Um, the bit that our, our club members have found quite amusing is at the end it plays a little fanfare when you finish your course. Um, there has been uh, suggestions that we change that to SI beeping sounds, etc. But I think people are getting used to the to the slightly fun uh, fanfare at the end and the slightly fun beeps as you as you hit the um, uh, uh, controls. Right, we go back to just a quick question, Scott, while uh, while you yep. pause for breath. The question from Roger about a control radius. Yeah. So thank you, for the question, Roger. He says, I was beginning to think you were doing so well because you had absolutely no questions come in. So we'll just fire the first one. Um, with control radiuses set to 15 meters and GPS accuracy to 100 meters, does this effectively increase the control radius to 15 meters? Or is the effect that if your GPS accuracy happens to be worse than 100 meters, your location is mistrusted and tracking is suspended? Yes, pretty much. Uh, so there's a little bit of both here. What I found in testing is that actually the control radius, um, uh, if your GPS accuracy is down to three meters, for example, the control will only register if you're three meters away. So your the control circle will not assume that you've hit the control at 15 meters it'll it'll wait until you actually get to it so in big open areas you know, it's almost like si air um i think i mean it is slightly dependent on your phone we found that some phones are more accurate than others um <clears throat> certainly on iphones we found um that all the way back to an iphone 6 um that the control uh, radius even at 15 meters you have to effectively be next to the control if you're in a big open area and the accuracy for your GPS is spot on. Um, what, what it tends to mean though is as your accuracy gets worse um, the control radius gets bigger and there it's a little bit more it still expects you to be within 15 meters ish um, you're not likely to get lots of missed punches you have the odd missed punch now and again um, but I certainly have found that there are there aren't huge mispunches. 
um, uh, I think, you know, as with all um, GPS technology, uh, it's sort of dependent on on um, the accuracy of the, where the, the mapping itself, um, and we'll come back to that uh, a little bit. Um, and having a control in a deep depression next to a cliff means you're unlikely to get a very successful um, registration on GPS. Does that make sense, Natalie? It makes sense to me. Hopefully, it makes sense to Roger and everyone else. <laughs> but yeah, thanks for that question. Okay, um, so let me flip back to the slides quickly. So, um, so that's it as an orienteer. It's it's pretty simple to use. Like I said, um, uh, two of our club members they they printed out the map. A map. Uh, they hadn't had a smartphone. They printed out a map in the first weekend that we did it, and went and ran their 45th wedding anniversary uh, on one of the courses, um, and ordered some smartphones that day, and uh, have been probably some of our heaviest users um, since. And they post a weekly update on which courses they run each week. And so, so the first time they've got a smartphone, it's phone is largely to run on one of these courses, which is great. Um, so, okay, using it as a uh, course planner, um, and this was the bit that obviously, personally, I was uh, keen on because I, like I said, I hadn't mapped anything. I was trained how to map um, just before Christmas. I did my first urban map over the Christmas period. Um, I was just getting ready to, uh, I planned some courses on it with, uh, so my son had been helping plan some courses on it. We were getting them controlled by another club member. Uh, we were ready and raring to go with our first urban event. Um, and then lockdown happened. And I sort of thought, damn, um, I, I want people to use this map. Um, and so I was quite keen on getting something up and running quickly that allowed me to share the map and let people have a go on it, partly to get feedback about the map, um, but partly just to have a go and have a run on it. So. Um, you seemingly go work for me in the sense that uh, I could quickly take the map that I'd created in OCAD. I knew it was properly geolocated because I'd effectively mapped straight from um, OpenStack OS data. I'd mapped it from LiDAR and I'd mapped it from uh, obviously using over overlays in OCAD 2020 on, on Google. So I knew it was pretty accurate. Um, I could take it straight into Purple Pen and plan a course. Um, and then all I had to do was export the PDF maps from Purple Pen and a single XML file as a single click. And I'll go through that and show you how to do that. And then it was a simple single form to upload them to uh, into your single go. And off we were, we were, were having a go and, and running round. So for me, it was a really simple workflow for somebody that had created a map, created some courses and wanted to share them with people for training. Um, so uh, why why did we then go on to have a go at it? Like I said, um, we could use our extensive library of uh, urban OCAD maps. Um, majority of them were geolocated already, so that was great. Um, and we could start to experiment with some of our more recent um, OCAD maps as well for forest areas. Uh, Purple Pen obviously is free to use, so it didn't mean that more than one person could be creating courses. Um, we didn't have a steep learning curve. Um, I know we did have a look in uh, to map run for some of the um, KML files and stuff. And for, personally, I found that quite difficult to get my head around, whereas just a quick export from Purple Pen was something that um, I could quite easily get my head around. Um, it also allows you to have score and line courses in the same file, so you can have multiple courses at single location. Um, and because it was, uh, it's there's no real administration around uploading things. It meant that we could have multiple planners uploading courses. So there's already three of us that have uploaded courses for Bok, um, and there are two other uh, members as well currently planning courses um, and finalising maps. So it meant that we've got many more people being able to help with some of the overhead of um, creating our virtual courses. Um, the other thing that we found as well is that there's no size limit on the files because they're all PDFs. Um, they can be high high quality printable maps, um, and they tend to be 
they're not huge files uh, for the base maps then. That, that means that we don't have the same limitations around uh, uploading uh, sizes of files that we found when we were trying um, map run. The only thing to be wary of is when you do export it in Purple Pen, it needs to be in uh, version 3 XML. It was an easy mistake that I made the first time that I did it, but that's an easy drop down and I'll show, show you that as well. Like I mentioned earlier, um, the all of the application is stored on Google's platform. So it's not like it's sort of stored on somebody's backroom server. It's high, got high availability, it's highly resilient, um, means that, you know, we didn't fear publicizing it, that it would go down the following day and with an overload from people using it. The one thing that we have had to think about is obviously uh, control location as we're planning courses. Like I said, deep gullies, depressions can confuse, can confuse GPS easily. However, we haven't had to think about um, uh, having to just have controls in things you can spot from uh, Google Maps, for example, because as long as the base map is uh, accurate, we can put controls on anything uh, in the map. Um, and it's actually the map accuracy that's the biggest thing on whether or not a control registers. And I'll come back to that when I talk about some of the considerations for mapping. Um, well, so, OK, let's have a quick look then uh, at course planning. So let me, and this is where I'm hoping it will allow me to uh, flip to purple pen. So while you're there, Scott, just a quick one. Um, yeah. So can we ask, um, just to clarify that running the courses on this app, does it solely depend on the fact you already have an OCAD map of the area you want to use? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I think, I mean, you can take, uh, you can create, there is, on the Usinglo website, there's, there's some, obviously there's a small community of people now and they have posted instructions on how you can take um, the open, you know, Ollie's open uh, map type maps, convert them into something that you can upload into um, into Usinglo, you know, et cetera. But that wasn't, personally, that wasn't our primary purpose. Our primary reason for using this was to, to use what we would deem as normal or interior maps and get them out to our members to use because we had no mechanism uh, historically for, for sharing maps other than obviously printed maps at events. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I've got a uh, purple pen up here. Uh, one of the things obviously to think about is uh, whereas quite a lot and our, our, you can see on the screen here I've got uh, what looks like two maps. It's not actually two maps. It's just um, I've got a big a3 map which is our urban area stroke um, open forest area map of, uh, close to East Bristol um, but it would be no good for us sharing an A3 map for home users because very few people have home A3 color printers um, so one of the things we did think about quite carefully was making sure that we were putting up courses that could be uh, rescaled back down to an A4 map uh, so people could print them at home um, and we're also now starting to think about how do we get maps to people that are uh, that don't have colour printers at home. So when we we do have a weekly club training run, and we're starting to think maybe that's an opportunity for us to hand over maps from from people that don't have colour printers to, to to from people that have already used the the maps. So we're starting to think about mechanisms for sharing maps among uh, club members as well. Um, so if I zoom in a little bit more, uh, one of the things that we did do, obviously, with the map is we didn't want it to feel like our normal um, structured, proper events. So we changed the format that we put on our maps just to make them look slightly more informal. So we just have the logo. We just have, obviously, the name of the location, the scale. Um, we have been using what three words is a easy way of um, sharing the start location with people. Um, although obviously Usinglo allows you to, to find the start anyway from Google Maps. Um, and one of the things that we um, also did was to make sure that we were using recent maps and I'll come back on to that um, uh, and around 
uh, underlying map data when I talk about uh, mapping things. So there's a score score course on here, um, and if I click on the permanent score course, one of the things to be wary of if you're a planner is that Yasinglo expects your score course, each control, to have a score attached to it, which you change in the little um, uh, box, the, the end box on your uh, uh, control sheet in um, Purple Pen. If you don't fill that in, uh, when you upload it in Singlo, it won't it won't work. It won't work as a score event because each control doesn't have a score attached to it. So that was again something we learned early on. Um, once you've got all of the scores in like that, then then that's it. That be exported. What I'm going to quickly do now is just show uh, if I add another course, I'm going to add a um, uh, fa fast and fury. If I can spell furious uh, line course, um, I've got the start on there already. I'm going to add a couple of controls. I'm just going to use the uh, controls I already had from the um, from the permanent uh, uh, the uh, score course. All right, so I've now got a five control line course as well in my. Uh, uh, purple pen file so if i then go to file and create pdfs and courses it's effectively as simple as that i've got permanent score course a fast and furious line course keep all of the um, settings exactly the same um i'll i'll call it webinar just as so i know that it's the right files uh create one per course Click create, it will create my PDFs for me. Uh, so that's my two courses. Now, the one thing that I then need to do is to create the XML file. You go to create data interchange file. Um, it's set to save it in the same file as the purple pen file. This is the bit that you have to do. You have to change it to version three. You click save and that's it. Right, so I've now created a course. I've exported them in um, Purple Pen. Um, I'm now going to go quickly to uh, back into the Singlo website. So I'm now in the Singlo website. I've got this Upload Event tab. If I click on Upload Event, I'm already logged in as me. I literally click and find, and I'll quickly find the. Uh, That's the XML file that I created. I click choose that. Uh, you can see that it's already got uh, controls on it. Um, we, we have been using test events, so I will put a test on here so that people know not to expect to run on it properly. You can put in a, a full description. We've been using the description to say things like if, we, if it's um, overgrown at the moment, make sure you're wearing leg cover. Um, if there are road crossings, we're writing that in the description. Um, you know, if there are things to worry about uh, from a risk perspective. Um, and then in event, event category, this is where we have been putting um, Bristol uh, Orienteering Club is one word. And this is how all of our um, uh, events show up in that list, in that event category. Um, by just putting that one tag in there. I then have to um, find my maps. So there's my permanent map and there's my uh, line course map. And then because it's a score course, I can also add a maximum time into it. So I can say 45 minutes for my maximum time. And then I literally click publish. Oh, I was adding asking me for a description expecting a description okay click publish that's it uh, wait for the little green thing it's now registering it um, and then if I go to all events now can zoom into that area uh, 
there it is. There's my Warmly Forest test event. Um, and then we can see the map that we just created with the five uh, controls on it. That, that's it. That's, that's how difficult it is. Um, like I said, uh, we ran a virtual Eucala at the weekend. Um, four other club members had uploaded their own maps um, to, to run on over on the uh, night uh, courses. So there were some, some interesting test maps up on the uh, Eastern Globe uh, website over the weekend. Um, right, uh, so that's it in Purple Pen. Let me just quickly go back to uh, the slides. Um, so, right, uh, final bit, we're on the final leg. So, uh, a couple of things that we've learned, obviously, uh, as part of mapping and planning. Um, we're obviously aware that OCAD maps have uh, copyright issues. Um, and what we've done as a club is thought carefully about uh, the provenance, effectively, of the maps that we've used. So, we've really only used maps that have been recently created and can be uh, attributed to open source government data, i.e. that's OS, OpenStack and the Environment Agency LiDAR data. Um, what we've then used um, on those maps is one, we're quite clear that it's an informal event and secondly, uh, for training purposes, obviously we're not selling the maps um, through an event, uh, we, we're only giving them away for free um, and we have used the open government um, uh, license version three. If you look at any of our maps, you can see what we've used that for. And that open government license effectively covers a whole raft of um, free data, which includes both that OS OpenStack and environment agency data. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm assume, I assume there's still a risk. I'm, I assume BOP at some point will come out with some formal guidance for us. But in, in these times, we felt comfortable that we could we could use that as long as we were careful about the provenance of the underlying data in in the maps and that we were obviously only using them for no commercial gain. One of the other things that we're obviously thinking about is that the normal risk assessment of courses still stands. We still need to think carefully about road crossings. We still need to think carefully. One of the areas that we're using is uh, got quite a lot of high cliffs in it, so we think carefully about route choice and making sure that we don't send people, even though they are on their own, they are obviously on personal training um, uh, events and it's classed as personal training. Um, I feel, still think it's important for planners to make sure that we are sending people out on courses that are safe. Um, one of the things that we have um, found, and we, we to, uh, to our I guess a couple of us have spent many, many lost days now playing with uh, maps that were not, not created from scratch using LiDAR data. Um, maps that were sort of lovingly created using the traditional methods um, inherently have uh, anomalies against the geo-referenced data that GPS expects. Um, and what we found is some of our maps, whilst on the ground with a compass running, would be incredibly accurate could have features that were up to 30 meters away from their real world geolocation. Of course, then a geo, uh, you know, GPS signal thinks you're in a completely different place from the, the actual feature. Um, and we struggled with many of our maps that didn't, weren't created from scratch using LiDAR data because of that. The other thing we rec recognized was that maps that weren't geo-referenced properly to British National Grid in OCAD but just geo-reference to national sta uh, uh, international standards. Again, we had some problems with those. Um, and then the final thing that we had all sorts of issues with was, and I know uh, finding out this as a new mapper, uh, we should be doing this any, every year anyway, but because uh, Magnetic North has moved quite a lot quite quickly in the last couple of years, uh, even a map two years ago, we would find that it had rotated enough that controls at the far end of each map would be geolocated incorrectly. Um, so we've had to make sure that we double check the geolocation of every single map. Um, obviously, that's slightly easier to do with urban maps because you can open up Google Maps in uh, OCAD itself in the latest version um, and you get to see uh, and overlay it. 
it's a bit more problematic with forest maps, but like I said, having importing the latest LIDAR data, um, the point cloud LIDAR data from um, the Environment Ag Agency has allowed us again to double check that our georeferencing is correct. Um, and what I'm going to quickly do is... If so I, still I think want... that, that answers, Scott. Peter, uh, folks have just asked a quick, quick, quick question earlier about um, is it possible to use poorly georeferenced maps with the using Go? So I think Scott's answered that. Um, yeah. for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to quickly click into um, OCAD so you can actually see what I mean uh, by it. Um, so once it switches over, I'll... Flipping into OCAD. So this is one of our urban maps, Dursley. Um, you know, completely accurate map, no problem whatsoever. Um, but if I if I look at the and it's it's set to British National Grid, which is great. Um, but and the magnetic uh, uh, declination, the angle, is at minus 1.4. If I click on this button within OCAD, uh, what you find actually is that its current location is minus uh, 0.3 or 0.4 so it's already one degree out well what does that mean um, let me uh, quickly open up and I'll, I'll show you this quickly just so you get a sense of what it means so that's the same area in google maps if i load that in as a background map um, and I zoom in on this uh, quickly. You can see that road there uh, at the top is off by probably, and that's quite a wide road. So that's probably 15 meters of rotation away from where the actual, where the map is from where it actually should be geolocated. And um, when you start to look at then trees and things like that, where we might have, because it's a point feature, you might have a control being 15 or 20 meters off. That does cause us problems that people run up to the tree, but they think the control's on, it doesn't beep, and they get really annoyed even though they've got a 15 meter control radius because actually the map is, is rotated slightly incorrectly by potentially up to 30 meters at the far ends uh, of, of it. Um, so how do you fix that? Let me just uh, remove that background map a second uh, and go back to uh, well, the first thing you have to do is you have to uh, transform it back to uh, to the correct magnetic north. So you rotate the map to magnetic north. Uh, luckily, there's a feature in uh, the latest version of uh, OCAD to do that. And you just click OK. That's now rotated my map correctly, um, which is fine. Um, let's open up the Google map again. And what quickly import that to see whether or not it rotated it enough. Um, I bear with my internet connection. So load it again. It's still slightly off. So uh, what I have found on many of our uh, maps is what I've had to do is go and uh, select all objects um, and Luckily, I know what this needs to be. Uh, I have to rotate this by 2, 0.2 degrees. Um, I've rotated all of the objects. Uh, and now it's much closer to where it needs to be. It's slightly off still, just here. You can see it's slightly off. But given that this is a square course, I can then use uh, transform and a fine where I can click in the middle of that junction and then the middle of that junction click return and now my map is pretty uh, i've managed to budge it but my map normally would be uh, pretty accurate by then but that that's we've had to do that with all of our maps effectively is to realign them to the actual geolocation um and uh if you don't do that you get all sorts of uh, problems. It's relatively simple to do and um, one of the things I would say is, um, and I'll go back to the slides quickly because I've got the links in it, um, is that Ben Mitchell um, as the new OCAD uh, administrator stroke supplier in the UK has written an excellent um, 
uh, set of how-tos georeferencing existing maps that are not uh, currently georeferences. Um, that's on his website, Mitchell Maps. Um, like I said, there's a link to uh, Usinglo here, and I'm sure Natalie will share these slides around afterwards. Um, and then there's a link to all of our the box materials on um, uh, our, our virtual orienteering courses with the sort of uh, how-to for our members to download the app and use it. So that's it, Natalie. You, you know, I've just got a few quick, quick vital questions that have come in, Scott. We must fire them at you. I thought the, the lining up with the magnetic north was something that was really useful and probably applicable, um, obviously, across all um, platforms. Um, but Deborah's asked, if your map is not accurate, can you plan your course on Google Map and then provide a PDF of the course on your poorly geo-referenced map for printing? Um, yes, you could. The The only thing is that, yeah, you'd have to have in, um, you'd have to have in Purple Pen an accurate Google map that you, you, you put your, um, um, uh, control uh, circles on. It has to be a, a, an accurate georeference because effectively Purple Pen creates an XML file that's got georeferencing data in it. So if you import, I can imagine, I'm sort of thinking it through now, I can imagine you using OCAD to import, uh, just like I did then, an image um, uh, of Google, of the area that you want to use, um, then opening that up in Purple Pen, because it will show background maps in Purple Pen as well if you want. Um, doing your controls and your uh, course and creating the XML file, that won't have the, um, obviously, the, the Google map then in it. It's just the XML file with the geolocation in it. And then you can upload whatever PDF you want um, as a course. Uh, interestingly, I think this, I looked at some of the Swiss um, what the beauty of using law is you can just go around the map and look at other people's uh, uh, courses. I looked at some of the Swiss ones. Um, some clubs don't share their maps in Switzerland. What they share is a PDF with a an email address um, that you email the person to get your map sent to you by email. So that you know some clubs are using it in slightly different ways. The technology allows you to do that um, as long as you've got a properly geo-referenced XML file from Purple Pen. So you have an, um, another kind of similar topic, um, much experience of using OO maps and other things. You've primarily focused on using, obviously, traditional OCAD maps. I've used OCAD, but um, uh, yes, but I, I, the uh, OO maps, so um, get me if I'm wrong, which one's, one of them's free, the free version of OCAD, isn't it? Is that OO maps? Well, no, that's the... The open orienteering maps is like the... the like the, the system that kind of like enables you to snip a map anywhere that you want yes. in the in the country with the various layers. You can. Uh, we haven't done it. Um, I'm. I have noticed that. Um, I think DVO um, have had started to have a play, and I've noticed that there's some maps that are slightly different that they've been playing with. Um, there are. I think. Um, if it isn't on the Singligo website, there's a link to uh, Tron's Facebook page that he hosts. There, there was a link that explained how to use those sorts of things to create maps as well. So it is possible to use uh, other materials other than OCAD. Yeah, um, to create your yeah. map. Yeah. What about a few more, more practical issues, such as things that have been encountered with, for example, map run, such as your screen dying when you're, um, your screen, you know, turning off when you're running your course? Have you encountered anything similar? Well, so because uh, we've only got, I think I've only, I can only think of one member that currently uses the phone as the map to run with. Um, most runners have printed maps out and just use the phone as uh, so what so personally the way I use it is I've got a small bag with me I click my phone click start I've got a printed map with me obviously I run like I'm running a normal orienteering course I put my phone in the little bag I've got the volume up very very loud um, and I'm just using it like a, a you know an audible um, a control punch um, so I've not got the screen running or anything I've just literally got it 
binging. You don't need to leave the screen on um, for it to still work. It works in the background. Okay, so you're using as a function, it seems very much um, kind of like the halfway house between map run and root gadget almost, that ability to um, create training exercises and courses and offer traditional map printed and running, which is which is really good. What about the fact that um, GPS coverage in forest, um, is map run any different or is they, are they both reliant on the same kind of GPS function of your smartphone? They're still reliant on the GPS capabilities of your smartphones. Like I said, we we've had really positive experiences with iPhones. We've had, um, you know, a, and um, it's difficult to say. Um, people seem to be getting on with Samsung phones. I've got a we've got another club colleague that has had a Nokia phone and he's had nothing but challenges with it. But that could be the GPS chip that's in it. We don't we don't really know. Um, what the problem uh, was with his individual phone. Most people have found that it's relatively accurate. Where it isn't accurate, we sort of know that there's already a problem with that map in one of the areas of the map might be slightly geolocated uh, incorrectly. So one or two of our maps at the edges, we know that they're out by maybe five meters, um, at which point we're sort of letting people know that those maps are slightly out. Um, I think people have, Finding it a bit fun, running around trying to find the controls, waiting for the thing to mm. beep, so using it as a little bit of a game as well. So you know, it's it's not serious, is it? It's not like we're using it for timed events. It's not replacement for SI. It's it's there just to give us something to to give our keep us keep the love of orienteering going, really. <laughs> what about the way then talking bringing it back to competitive because i know we're all competitive is there some way of going back in and you know like eyeballing the results of you know seeing that natalie weir's completed your your course um and you know seeing if you know like eyeballing the results from an organizer perspective uh, yeah, I mean, you can go into the app itself and see the results of all of the individuals. Um, yeah, no problem whatsoever to do that. Um, like I said, um, so I, like I, I've been in contact with Trond. Um, he is thinking about web results. So there is potentially facility for web results, which will make that a little bit easier than going in the app and looking at results. And I know other... you mentioned it last week, but the thing that really excited me, the smartwatch thing. So it just beeped on your watch you. That's what he's going to develop first, is that he's developing a smartwatch app. Now, I don't know which smartwatch he's talking about, um, it, you know, but it, it, it's the ability to download it onto your watch, leave your phone at home and use your watch effectively to beep at the controls. That feels to me like uh, that's that, that would be great fun. I, you know, not having to carry my phone around with me would be really useful. And just to check, it doesn't work. You can't do it a different way around, a bit like Root Gadget. You know how you go for a run with your Garmin watch on and then you can upload your um, GPX file. It doesn't work that way, like like how Root Gadget works. Yeah. No, it's uh, you go for a run with the app running itself. Um, I guess that's, I mean, I, like I said, it was quite good fun. I'm not sure it was good fun in the middle of the night, but it was quite good fun doing my virtual Eucala. Um, I, I ran, you know, 15.8k course with with a, a map jingling in the middle of the night just me and the owls um <laughs> well you can do you can do these virtual courses whenever you, you like scott if you want to go and do them at that time but what about things like um if you want to take off a course you can use your organizer portal can you just delete a course if you yes. want to take one off there you don't want yeah. people to use it anymore Yes, yeah, so whoever organise, whoever puts the course up is effectively the administrator for that course. So, like I said, already three of us within the club have uploaded courses. Um, so that person would need to to delete that one. I I can't access and play with the course that somebody else has put up. Um, but like we we tend to put up a test course for a week. So with whilst we're testing them to make sure that the controls register properly etc we'll put it up and we'll call it a test event in our weekly email that goes out we say we do test events you're free to run on them but just be prepared the results aren't going to stay because we're going to delete them before putting a real one up um, and that's how we're coping with it we're we're sort of uh, deleting a test event um, probably once a week and then we're putting a new 
event and stroke course up most weeks at the moment. I think what you said quite well is how we're not here trying to replace um, traditional orienteering functions of SI and, and, and reach new controls. It's a way of enabling us um, to energise and invigorate our members to come and do, uh, do something. And whilst we want it to be as, um, I know what we're all like, I'm the same, has to be competitive. And if I can't see other people's results and how the other people that I know have done it, then, you know, that's all part and parcel of it, but that's all part of the fun. Um, there's a few other questions that um, we might not have gone into too much detail on answering, but we'll make sure that Scott sent all the question and answers afterwards um, so he can um, finalise anything. Um, this session has been recorded and you'll be sent a link to that. You can obviously share it and watch it any time afterwards. Is there anything else you want to um, add, Scott, before we... No, uh -huh. just go out and have fun with it. That's what we're doing. We're still learning. So if anybody else plays with it, please share the learnings back to us as well. Yeah, exactly. And I think it seems like a fantastic um, training tool and there's probably a space for both um, platforms um, and for clubs to hopefully take away this information, have a play like Scott says, come back with any questions. Scott can be your guru. Um, and then, you know, as he says, let us know, have fun, keep orienteering, and we'll see you in the next session. We've got an exciting session next week, which is on um, the benefits of going cashless, card readers, um, entry systems. So that's all fun. So do register for that if you want to on Tuesday the 23rd. But otherwise, thank you very much for Scott. Thank you everyone for listening, and we'll see you again in another webinar. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>